welcome to Same Script, Different Cast, Cut Act 1. Cut Act 1 is an extension of the SSDC podcast. I typically do that with Wikipedia, Plot Reader, and Movie Pop-Up. So today you're with me, seeing it, and I'm going over American Horror Story 1984. This is episode 8, Rest in Pieces. So this episode starts with... Brooks and Donna, they're in a diner talking about getting their revenge to Margaret. They're working out the details as far as when to sneak into Camp Redwood, what they're gonna do. Donna tells Brooke she needs to eat up because Margaret, she probably got that crazy lady strength. And Donna wants Brooke to be that final girl, especially since black folks don't have that luck to survive in horror movies. I wanna report the news. I don't wanna be the news. Besides, brothers don't last long in situations like this. Brooks and Donna are approached by Stacy. She reveals to them that she's a writer for the Inquirer. And she tells Brooks that she looks just like the Brooke, the Brooke that was charged for the Camp Redwood murders that was supposed to have been executed. Stacy lets them know that she's also on her way to the music festival. And she likes writing books on serial killers and human monsters. Brooks and Dunn politely leave Stacy saying they will see her at the camp. Cut to Bruce, a.k.a. Dylan McDermott, Delmont Montrondi. That's right, it's time for... Dylan McDermott, Montrondi. You see that he recovers and he's actually driving to Camp Redwood in a pink Mary Kay car. And he picks up our favorite hitcher that just won't die. As they're driving along, there's tapping from the trunk. Bruce stops, pops the trunk, and then we actually see the Mary Kay saleswoman. She pleads for her life and he corrects her. But I corrected them, sir. Unfortunately, she doesn't convince Bruce to let her live. Though she's the saleswoman of Mary Kay. Oh, she has that pink caddy for a reason. Please, just let me go. I won't say anything. That's the best you could do? Seriously, I expect more out of Mary Kay. I mean, you got this fancy car. Doesn't it make you like a really good salesman? Cut to Kaja Goo Goo. Yeah, they're dead. The assistant, Courtney, tells Margaret. So why the hell did it take so long for you to tell me that one of our headlining acts has been murdered? You're going to get yourself a roll of plastic sheeting, a box of garbage bags, a pair of good rubber gloves, and a sharp butcher's knife. And you are going to get rid of all of these bodies. <laughs> I can't. I can't do that. I'm a small, diminutive man. As Courtney cleans up the bodies, he walks around to the back of the van and he sees Kaja Gugu rehearsing. So he's just like, all this work I did, all this work I did, cleaning this up. Yeah, he has no idea of the, the curse of the campground. Cut to backstage of the concert where we see the nice stalker who's just like roaming around. He's stepping on the scene and he sees a Billy Idol worker and they chit chat for a little bit and the worker gives Night Stalker a guitar pick used by Billy Idol. Night Stalker is so psyched. He does a mean air guitar, rom, rom, rom. And Jingly out of nowhere just comes in, bum rushes him. Night Stalker is not aware at this time that Jingly is already dead and this is actually his ghost attacking him. You never should have gone after my family. I told you there'd be a price to pay if you fucked me over. And then during this fight, Jing Lee gets hit by Bruce in the pink Cadillac. He got away. Oh, Richard Ramirez, your picture's all over the news for you. Holy shit! Understandably, the night nice stalker is upset with Bruce for running over Jing Lee because that was his guy. He almost had him. He almost had him. Bruce is all fanboy, like, you are the night nice stalker, man. I'm about to meet your record. Did we just become best friends? What? Did we just become best friends? Yep. Bruce shows his Mary Kay body to the Night Stalker and he reveals that he's actually after Brooks and Donna for they stole his thumbs. Night Stalker tells Bruce that that was Jing Lee he was going after, that he hit with his car. Bruce offers to help the Night Stalker. So the Night Stalker summons the devil right there in the dirt road, draws a symbol, cuts his wrist, lets the blood flow from his wrist to summon the GPS location for Jing Lee. Then Jingli resurrects from the car wreck. There's the hitcher again. And Jingli asks the hitcher, like, why does it feel like this? Wondering if every time that you die, how does it feel? And the hitcher says, I don't know, it gets better. Meanwhile, Bruce and the Night Stalker are still searching for Jingli. And then out of nowhere, a ghost ninja, Xavier pops up. 
and he takes Bruce a nice stalker to the real Jing Li's body. As Xavier is showing Bruce and the Night Stalker that Jing Li is dead, Jingles ghost ninjaness his way on the scene and guts Xavier. Bruce is totally confused with all of this magic. The Night Stalker tells Jing Li he still owes a debt to the devil, and now Jing Li can't leave the site to protect his seed. So Night Stalker tells him he's gonna go all northern exposure and kill Jing Li's son. Then Margaret Again, another ninja, she's a real life ninja, lick shots into Jingle's ghost head. The nice soccer asks, why the cop block though, Margaret? Come on, boo. Cut to Miss Stacy, the tablet writer, popping up at the hotel room of Brooks and Dunn. She lets them know she knows their identities. She knows about Donna's daddy issues and reveals how she pieced it together with the tape from the warden regarding the execution. They tell her, all right, bet you got us. So take us with you to Camp Redwood and we'll tell you everything, but you cannot reveal that Brooke is still alive or Donna's identity. Brooke promises to reveal the true story to Stacy, secretly planning to kill her. This is where I woke up, totally disoriented and afraid. Oh, hey, that's good. Can I quote you? Sure. But Donna stops Brooke, saves Stacy, and convinces Brooke to focus on Margaret. I need to help you kill one person, one yes. person only. Bitch, run. No! As Stacy flees, she is quickly killed by Bruce, Night Stalker, and Margaret. Stacy tries to make a deal, letting them know that she'll make them famous with her journalistic words, but that meant nothing to them. Oh my god, you're the Night Stalker. You're Margaret Booth. You two are together. So what she said is true. Well, I don't know what she told you, but anything is too much. I'm a writer. Use me. I can make serial killers look sexy and fun. Margaret reveals to Bruce and Night Stalker her plan to kill the rest of the bands. I want to do something that will change the world. We're going to kill every musician that's coming for the festival. Except Billy Idol. They made it a point to say, not Billy Idol at this festival. So in order to make some money, think about all the places where someone famous has died. Jim Morrison's grave, the archway at the Dakota where John Lennon was shot, Graceland. Cut to the dead counselors and the imitators, the folks who were also killed by Jing Li. They capture Jing Li after he resurrects from his gunshots. They tie him up and refuse to allow him to escape because all he wants to do is kill the Night Stalker. It's revealed by Jing Li that Montana was the Night Stalker's boo. And how he kills, it actually got worse. So he's telling them not only just adults that he was killing, but anyone, children, babies, everyone is now fair game. And Xavier Ray are just like, what, you dated the Night Stalker? They actually continue to stab Jing Li on the pier. So after stabbing him and letting him drift off in the boat, Bobby, remember Jing Li's little brother? His ghost appears just like baby Jason from the Friday the 13th, jumps from the lake and then drags Jing Li into the water. Montana watches this happen. Jing Li then awakens next to Bobby and their mom, the Vavitch Lavinia, who convinces Jing Li to stay with them. Although now we see that Jing Li is really sad because he knows he will not be able to save his son. He's stuck. Montana reveals to Trevor her desire to kill everyone that comes to the campground. Trevor loves Montana and offers to also be dead like her so he can join her, but she pushes him away, guilty about her relationship with the Night Stalker. She didn't know he was gonna go all ape shit. And that's gonna conclude this week's recap. I'm unsure what to expect for the next episode, how it's gonna go down, if it's gonna be the typical 35, maybe 40 minutes long of an episode. But what I found interesting in doing some Googling about the Night Stalker or Richard Ramirez, he died in 2013. The killings were from 1984 to 1985. So with this story, with American Horror Story, the killings are continuing in 1989. And he also was married. Her name was Doreen Leoy, L-I-O-Y, in case you wanna look her up. They were married from 1996 to 2013 and it, they got married in San Quentin. I just don't know what goes through women's minds sometimes, why they like him and the fact that Ted Bundy got married when he was in prison too. So mm, there's, there really is someone for everyone. All right, thank you so much for joining me. Same script, different cast, cut to act one. We are almost at the last episode for American Horror Story. See you next time. I think the 